It's story time. Time to start the day. <laughs> Go ahead, Aiden. You want you want to you want to start? Yeah. Uh, so the, I mean, you had asked me the question about um, about like the coaching stuff and and the yeah. coaching work I've done with individuals and groups. Um, something I found really effective is this idea of like the story you tell matters, and uh, not just about. Um, not just like the outward story, but like the inner story, like, and there's a lot of psychology to back that up, but like the self narrative, I always think of that as like the way you see the world. It's like the filters that you put on and just like a chemical reaction, like the thing that comes from the outside is either going to like bounce off of that or explode or do whatever. Like you can't control the circumstance, but the way that your stories and the way that you've like, you perceive the world changes how circumstance affects your life. So, so just being really conscious about the stories that you're telling yourself has been really effective for me and effective for other people that I've like shared it with. And uh, that's something that is just not always talked about, especially among like very wise, objective people. Like the fact that you can have multiple interpretations of your life and none of them are necessarily right or wrong, but some of them are definitely more useful than others. And uh, that's a hard thing for like rational people to sometimes rock that it's okay to change those stories but what does this have yeah. to do with technology i'm sorry i didn't mean to cut you off mike what, no, does you this go ahead, go ahead. what does it have to do with technology aiden uh a lot of things actually um i mean this whole idea uh has come out of working with a lot of um a lot of people in the technology world like very objective people who are entrepreneurs and programmers and developers and product people um I think we, we have a, we're very comfortable like changing our perspective about new information we have when we're building a product uh, or building a company, but we don't often give ourselves the same liberty to like change our own interpretation of our own lives. And at the end of the day, like that's what it's all about. Like we're all playing this, this game, doing our own thing, but like becoming better humans makes us better at the things that we're doing and also makes us more compassionate to the people around us. And like that leads to better products. So if I have to tie it back to technology, I'll be like, technology is a human endeavor and we're humans. So that's why I spend ha like a lot of my time on this. Way to bring it yeah, home. You, I like that. You know, you know that what you just said about, you know, making us better humans and telling better stories makes us better humans and that helps us build better products. That sounds exactly to me like the bootstrapping idea from Douglas Engelbart. Right. Douglas Engelbart thought that computers would make us smarter. And then once we were smarter, we designed smarter computers, which would make us smarter. And he called that bootstrapping society, boot, bootstrapping humanity. So I think you're really touching on, you know, you talk about well, how does it apply to tech? I think you're touching on some early roots of the kind of technology world that we all live in, in, in the computing space. And, you know, that comes from the 60s. That's over half a century. Uh, old and so I think I think it touches a lot of those same kinds of spaces and that's that's sort of the way I think about it as well you know um, Ken Aiden and I we, we told you we were talking about this a little bit earlier um, one of the things that I've thought an awful lot about is is how stories affect how people think uh, telling people stories you know I, there was like some Harvard Business Review article from several years ago about that was trying to convince you know, CEOs and leaders and things like why your brain loves good storytelling because it touches certain spots and it, it improves people's memory and so on and so forth. So when you're building a product, when you're doing a pitch, storytelling is an infinite, you know, an in intricate part of it down to the point of creating personas, creating characters that interact with your product, right? And this seems super clear when you're talking about games when you're talking about building gaming worlds. It doesn't always seem super clear when you're working on a mobile app, but all those things apply the way I think about it. Yeah, that's, I mean, you guys touch on so many great points in here. Um, I mean, I feel like I'm, I, I've had these conversations with Mike, so I'm always, every time I'm, I'm like, man, we've talked about this before, do I want to say it again? It's like, yes, yeah. of course, this is how you tell stories and this is how we remember and, and capture things. But um, storytelling is the foundation of what API Evangelist is and why I created this persona and it very much, it was my creation, like 2010, consciously going, I'm going to perform in this way and tell these stories to try to understand what's going on, but act that out so that other people can understand and learn as I'm as I'm figuring this out. And that was very much, I don't know if you and I, Aiden, have had these conversations, but Audrey, my wife, has her master's in folklore and storytelling. 
Yeah. And so, you know, it's very much was the foundation of API Evangelist. But I'm always amazed, and this kind of, I would say, comes back to what you said, Aiden, is I'm always amazed at um, people who will come out of the woodwork when I say how storytelling is the most important tool in my toolbox, it's the only thing that matters, that say the opposite and, and just so passionately, no, stories don't matter. No one in the tech space listens to stories. And that was kind of like what I was channeling when I asked you, it's like, why does this matter in tech? And I'm like, every time these people come out of the woodwork and Mike knows some of the cast of characters, they're the same kind of naysayers who push at Mike and push at me over the years. But, they're, you know, everything's stories. Everything around us is in the stories. Everything we believe, all of this construct, whether it's startup and pivoting to kind of use your language, you know, to investors, to how we influence the markets, it's all storytelling. And that's why it's also critical to technology because this is a very human story. Yeah, and I think um, just to lend credence to that, like I think my first experience with you was, um, I don't think we ever actually talked, but it was like in probably like 2012 or 2013. And I was looking for like a big library of Swagger files to use at my last startup and you were the person writing the stories about it and then like years and years and years later when i started working on optic um we were trying to learn the space really quickly and the way i learned the space was i uh, read probably more old api evangelist stories than than you've read in a long time like i, I probably can quote some of the older ones uh better than you and uh yeah it's just like it was a good bank of stories that helped one get up to speed quickly, which is why I love talking to people like you and Mike uh, and all the other people in the space who've been there a while who, who speak about it well is like, it's like sometimes you and I have a conversation and it's like I met a hundred users in the story you told about an experience that's common between them. Uh, so like, I think more industries would benefit from having um, like a, a shared set of mythology that people who are trying to make the space better could work from. And that like doesn't exist in a lot of places. Or if it does, it's like research papers, which like are different than stories and in many important ways. <laughs> you know, um, in, in Scandinavia, there's this, there's this pattern in large corporations. There's somebody who is the keeper of the history of the corporation. And they tell the history of the corporation to others. So they keep it close because that's part of a key part of their culture. And of course, in the Scandinavian language, those culture stories, those history stories are called sagas. Mm -hmm. So they have people who tell the sagas of Nokia and the saga of Telenor and the saga of all these companies, because that's where we're coming from. That's where we've been. That's what shapes us and molds us. So there's always somebody who has a primary role of keeping that story. And a lot of large corporations, even here in America, I remember I was so struck when I went to 3M Corporation, oh, years and years ago. So 3M Corporation, uh, Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing, um, has a fantastic history and it's built on a gigantic failure. They, they, the, they bought a bunch of land that they were going to use to mine. I, can't, I forget the product. Somebody else may be able to help me. They were going to mine this product and it turns out there wasn't any of that material in the land they bought. Mm -hmm. they, there was, they, the whole thing, they had got investors and everything it was a disaster. But there was a whole bunch of other stuff. I don't know, it was bauxite or something. They were like, yeah, I wonder if we could sell this. And it, they started actually building uh, abrasions and adhesives from the material that they had bought. It was not at all what they originally thought they were going to do. But the reason I know this story is they have at their main office a museum. They have a museum of those early experiences and newspaper articles about their failure and about all the things they did from there. And that's their saga. Their saga is creating all sorts of new unexpected products from whatever they have today. So a lot of what you're saying, Aiden, is, is directly on point. And I, I had really kind of missed a lot of that until almost the same uh, time frame. Aiden, you mentioned 2012, 2013. We were talking about, you know, Ken, uh, I met Ken in 2012. I actually got to sit down with you and talk with you in 2012 in Colorado. I had been teaching and writing and all these other things for more than a decade. And I was kind of burned out, I was frustrated, and I said, I'm not making connections. You told me about this idea of storytelling to make connections. It completely changed the way I thought about doing my work. And I, it really comes out of my experience with you. So here you've got two people that really 
learned this notion of storytelling from you. So my question to you, Kim, is where is this coming from from you? Was this from like day one or was there some epiphany for you on how important stories really were? How did this come about? Um, I mean, so the catalyst was definitely Audrey, my wife, and her, you know, um, but I would say that was just the seed that that pushed me. Um, and that's why I was curious when we kicked this off on Twitter, I was curious where this was going to go because I heard kind of slightly different angles from from Aiden, slightly different from Mike. And I definitely have this this deep wellspring with Mike that I know. And then I, over the last year or two, it with Aiden been cultivating. Um, so for me, it's it's very much a personal journey. It's very much like my therapy, my figuring myself out as I went out into the world and reinvent myself, to be honest. Like I I was had been on a certain tech track um, that I was unhappy with that I had set in motion, you know, a decade earlier at, at another reinvention of myself. And I'm like, oh, I'm gonna become a computer programmer and a professional and be a boss and make lots of money. And I hit the peak of that in 2008 and nine. I was like, oh, this money isn't where it's at. I'm making lots of money and I'm super miserable. Like I gotta figure this out. I gotta, and I know the root of it's me. It's not the, this, I just gotta find myself in all of this. And so I just turned on, and if you read API evangelist versus kinlang.com, you'll see it becomes even more stark because kinlang.com is very much like my journal. And some of it you'll read, you'll be like, oh, holy shit, why did he write this? Like, <laughs> can't believe he's saying this publicly. I mean, Mike, you've seen a few of my, my stories even on stage, but it's, it's really very much me working through my own baggage. And, and then 2016, you know, I thought I'd worked through most of it. And then 2016 hit, I mean, and I'm unpacking entirely new, you know, and realizing how much of my view of tech is wrapped up in who I am and who I saw myself in the world. I started unwinding a lot of my, you know, my belief in tech that, oh, tech's going to save us or tech's going to save my career or, you know, and then at the same time, it's like, wait, tech's saving my career. Like I had this whole career built around tech. And now, you know, so it's this kind of this virtuous cycle for me where it's like, I can tell these stories, share it. People are, um, enjoy them and like them and I guess are inspiring people and then really? but I'm working through my shit and I'm like having a good time and I'm figuring out and I'm the the world of techs coming into entirely new views and how these large organizations work and I'm like oh and all these people in these large organizations or these startups are all on their own journeys too and I can study their journeys and so it, it's all just been a fascinating ride for me and I'm still like on it trying to figure it out in real time and i just have found a certain comfort in being honest and open with other people about it i guess so that's that's cool that's very cool i know i know my own experience is is kind of similar i um i've had to kind of reinvent several times for lots of reasons throughout my life and i always used to think well this reinvention is because i screwed up this reinvention is because i'm not headed where i want should have been this reinvention is because I missed something important in the past. What I've really come to learn over the over the years, however, is that reinvention is always an opportunity. Like, you know what, sort of like what you said, this is not really what I want, or this is not fun, or this is not what I need, or this is not who my, you know, my family or friends need or whatever. I'm not who they need. So I can change that. And I think that's the thing that really uh, has struck me more than anything else. I can change who I am. I can change what I am. I can change what I do. I think the biggest thing that I've had to contend with over all of this time is I have a choice. Shit, <laughs> I chose this, crap. <laughs> Where I am is because of choices, not because of something that's, you know, like just magically happened. So I don't know, that's, that's kind of my point. Well, Aiden, Aiden talking about the, the pivoting in the business, like, like startup culture and i think aiden's closer to this than you and i are being yeah, you know yeah. it, the points in the journey where we are but like you're encouraged to like find a, a narrative work it work it work it until pivot until you find that traction now i think traction for a startup versus traction and and meaning as a human being or well i guess they're they're kind of I, some overlap I, I spend a lot of time with people i'm coaching 
making sure that those are two separate and not connected tracks for very obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. um, because one of them will have a, uh, a blip in it and the other one can be constant progress. And like, you don't want to have those things too much entangled. Yeah. I always joke with people that uh, I, I do um, startups by day and then I do stand up at night because it's a good fallback job in case the startup doesn't work out. Yes. Right. So, so I mean, that's, you're literal, right? You're literally saying this. You do stand up. You do stand up comedy at night. Yeah. yeah. That, that's another persona for you, right? That, that a lot of people probably don't know. A lot of people in this space. Yeah. Don't know. Comic Aiden uh, gets feedback immediately. And Comic Aiden <laughs> knows uh, the second he says something, whether or not it is going to land or whether it is a colossal failure. Um, and Startup Aiden sometimes has a week's or month's lag in different kinds of feedback, uh, constantly trying to get to the same immediate feedback that, that stand-up has offered. I love that. that that's, I, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, I, I have a friend who's you, but his name is Ben, but he does improv at night and starts by day. So his is improv is his, his saving, yeah, the, saving the problem. Day. The problem with improv with me, not to get into too many details, I won't name the characters, but, but people have realized that I'm very good at it at doing anything, including like characters that shouldn't exist in the real world. So I get typecasted really quickly in improv into things that I would not want to be typecasted into because I can pull them off. Then I'm like, I don't, I don't enjoy being that two words that shouldn't go together for 25 minutes. Like that's just not, I don't want that. I'm, I'm really, so this is really fascinating to me. Ken, so, so Aiden has like uh, comic Aiden, Stand up, Aiden. Do you have another persona that that feeds you in some other way that we don't know about? Um, I would say no, um, <laughs> and and I say that uncomfortably. Like, yeah, I don't. I don't have any. Like, I have one become each of my reinventions. So I'm so in and so focused on what I've done. I've had very little time for other things at all the stages of my life. And then I would say I've never been good at anything until API Evangelist. Like, seriously, like, and I say this, like, joking but real, is I just sucked at everything. I was, like, mediocre at, for so long at everything that I tried that I just was convinced that I was mediocre until I did API Evangelist, and I'm like, I'm successful at something. But then I'm, like, so into this role, I'm like, I have trouble being anything else now. And that's kind of my challenge and my burden right now. And, and I've hit the wall with that several times over the last couple of years is like, what is Ken outside of that? You know, and I'm, I'm still trying to figure that out, to be honest. As uh, for me, this past year, like everybody talks, we'll all have stories about the pandemic here, right? We'll all, we'll all talk about, well, what did you do? What was going on? There? This, this was another chance for me to really think about what I want to spend my time doing and, and who I want to spend it with and so on and so forth. And one of the things that I ended up picking up this year is I ended up picking up my saxophone again. Oh. I had, I spent, I had a whole career. I had another persona, 10 years of traveling around, playing, writing jingles, industrial music, wanting to be a movie score person, right? Studying with people, things like that and working nights, working, you know, eight shows a week, six nights a week kind of thing. And I stopped all of that decades ago. Uh, but over this uh, pandemic period, I said, gee, you know, I'm just kind of fidgety. And I've always kind of thought maybe I should do this. Well, I lucked out. There's a fantastic MIDI instrument that plays just like a physical saxophone, but there's no sound that comes out. So one of the first things I knew is like, I could sound like hell and I'm not gonna annoy anyone because it's been 30 years. But it turns out I do this now like 15, 20 minutes a day, almost every day. Nice. And it's a complete, it's like a, just a complete escape. And it gives me an immediacy like that Aiden, you mentioned, it gives me an immediacy that I don't get often when I'm working in screens, right? Or I'm writing code or I'm working on a book project that's gonna take months and months to do. So it's really, it's really given me uh, a, a way to feel good like right now with something that I'm doing and not worry about like any complications or anything. I just yeah. plug in, put the headphones on and it's a completely different experience for me. I think, I think something that occurs to me and this is something I've noticed in myself a lot during like those reinvention periods, which I've had to go through a few uh, in a very, like I'm 
much younger than you both, um, and I've already had to have a few ego deaths, which I'm very happy <laughs> in hindsight that I got to have them at the age I did. Um, but I just, I, I, it occurs to me, and I've seen so many examples of people who get to that point when they know one is like one is going away and a new one is coming, and people have trouble letting go of it, um, or or they don't accommodate it well. It's it's like what you said, mediocre, and you know they, they feel mediocre, they feel less than mediocre, and but but then how do you go beyond that? And I think that's where the self storytelling is like the thing that I found to be really effective for me and a few other people. And like this isn't new stuff. Like therapists and people in the psychology world talk about the inner narrative and the power of it. And so much of therapy is about reframing experiences. But I think this is like a productive idea that just like doesn't get talked about as, as much as that like you get to pick your story like that feeling that you have you get to choose it and I would argue that like choosing the right one affects the outcome and makes those inflection points in life that's where the fork happens is what story are you telling yourselves when when these things start um, and uh, I just want to help people like pick the right stories in those moments or or at least realize that they get to choose the story, that they have the responsibility to pick. And then the rest is like, happens, but but you get to decide how to interpret the past. You get to decide how to interpret the future. And you can be an objective person and still adopt a different story about your life. It doesn't mean that you're painting over anything. It's just choosing something that is productive and can move you forward. And I think to augment that and have a better answer to what Mike asked me is, I feel like I haven't found whatever that, that side thing is, that, that thing that nourishes me because one, I've spent the last four years have been heavy writing to shed my historical kind of baggage, who I was and make sense of that so I could be more comfortable in the now. And that so that storytelling has been really critical and you'll find that on kinlane.com if you're at all interested, but it's pretty dark stuff. But it's very much me working through my baggage and then dealing with writing on api evangelist and my current writing I'm, I'm in a good place with that i don't do it as much as i would like to now but i'm still i'm happy with that but the the missing link i would say for me to move forward into something is um i don't have enough of other people's stories part of me unpacking my baggage is realizing how just white and homogenized my intake of information and my my network and my people have been and i feel like i haven't a read enough stories because somewhere around 20 i stopped reading a lot i started i stopped reading books before then i just consumed books i loved it i've started that again but now i've realized i need more words from diverse stories uh, and going back in time in history and i'm i'm stuck i'm not stuck i'm in the 50s and 60s right now in the cybernetics and that whole realm right now and i'm reading i'm finding if you read many different books you get many different takes on it in many oh, at different the same angles. Time too. yeah they they all build on each other they all build on each other and so like i'm, I'm like and then oh if you read a person of color from the 60s you get this whole other wait yeah. the, the whole march up to the space race has this whole other realm to it and it's like oh civil rights just didn't magically happen in the late 50s and early 60s like world war ii and all there was this whole buildup, and so i feel like for me to figure out what's next for me and to continue storytelling i need to fill up the wellspring with other people's narratives and words because then i have a richer pot to work from my storytelling or if i get into art or music or some other thing i have i think i'll have a, a much deeper well to work from and that's kind of where i'm working right now so just reading can, yeah, uh, I was just gonna ask. Um, it seems like it seems like you like use storytelling really effectively to to make your own way in the world. Like you use it to paint paint the things around you to understand like the forward and also like looking behind you too. Um, and I'm curious, like there's no there's no rule in human history that that has to be done in public. Like what's what's driven you to make that journey something that is out there for everyone to see. Um, good question um i worry that it's ego sometimes like in because there is a certain amount where i'm like oh, i do like this you know i do kind of but it's gotten to the point where i need it and i don't like it like i am ha perfectly happy telling some you know awful story about my youth on my kim lane blog i don't tweet it out i don't want any you know 
but if people read it that's great but I haven't processed it until I've hit publish on it and it's up there publicly for some weird reason and I'm I keep trying to unpack it and I don't have a really good answer it's very therapeutical there's something liberating about sharing it and then through some of my other storytelling you know where I, I guess this learned behavior is you know we 2015 and so 2012 till th till May of last year we dealt with uh, uh, Isaiah my stepson's addiction and he finally passed last year and so I, I was very much processing my own addiction from before as part of my dealing with him and in 2016 when I did a very public kind of switch I was like oh this is very much about him um, but it's about me I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about me because he was in no position to talk about himself and he never was and never um, never will be now but I was I needed it and I put it out there and then the just flood of people in the space that had no idea who have children who cut themselves who are who just passed away or and you never hear any blip of it in their tweets in their storytelling who would email me and go hey thank you this is like I don't know how you can tell this publicly, but it's been very reassuring to me and it's very it helped me think through some of my own. And so that perpetuated it, but it's kind of a, a weird ball that I don't fully understand, but I know I need and I know is a is an important vehicle in, in my storytelling. So you know, the way you talk about the way you use writing to process sounds a lot like the journaling that Aiden's been talking to me about. It also reminds me of the writer Al uh, uh, Anne Lamott. I don't know if you know Anne Lamott's work. I've heard it. And I'm not familiar. She she also ha had a lot of uh, substance addiction and other things, and she uses writing to talk about that in her fiction work as well as her nonfiction work to do that same kind of work. And then one of the things that also comes to me when I when I listen to you, your storytelling. That, I mean, what you're just saying here is also a gift to others. Like you're actually telling stories that allow other people to reach out to you that they wouldn't have, other people to process maybe what they wouldn't. And that's an incredible gift. That's an incredible ability um, to, sh to share at some level in ways that empower others, right? So a lot of times I think about wh what am I doing that actually empowers somebody else? How am I improving anybody else's stature in life or anyone else's situation by saying this or by doing this, or am I just doing this on my own? And I, I think that goes back to some other stuff you mentioned about uh, when you go back and you read in the past, you read other narratives, read people's narratives from the 50s and the 60s and the 40s and the 70s. And one of the things that happens to me is when I read other people's narratives, uh, it suddenly changes mine. Mm -hmm. So now suddenly I have an anchor, like I lived in the 70s. I was active, blah, 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 in the 70s. I didn't know about this. So suddenly I know about something that was going on during you know, my lifetime. I know where I was at the time. Why wasn't I there? Or why didn't I see this? And so on and so forth. So there are so many other things. So even the stories you tell now become stories that create perspectives and points of view that people decades from now can relate to. And whether it's technology or whether it's personal, whether it's social or political, I mean, those stories change for me they change the past changing the past gives me a new opportunity in the future and that's one of the ways i think about storytelling is rewriting the past in order to see a different future great i like that um i'd like to shift shift this to visual storytelling and so picking up on uh some of mike's work and you had you had your daughter do some amazing uh, contributions to your work earlier on yeah. and this is I would say at one area that I continue to struggle with my storytelling is I'm just visually challenged like I I cannot do anything graphically to save my ass I just like but I see I have images in my head and I understand yeah. how how impactful storytellings are and like so like I was always fascinated when you would do the, that the one talk I'm thinking of, the journey, the journey one yeah. to the mountain. Yeah. And which I'll use some of the visuals when I process this. I want to grab some of the visuals from that and from Aiden's <laughs> world and we'll do some I'll do some sort of intro or outro to this, whatever we do. Okay. But yeah. um I was always fascinated going around talking to people. I I walked around to different 
groups at API Strat and at, at, at uh, Glucon where we were at in Colorado and asked people like, what do you think of that kind of storytelling? What do you think? And some people are oh, so visual, beautiful, you know, and, but it wouldn't, they didn't really get the story. And then other people were put off by it. There were some people that were just like, oh, it has yeah. no place at this tech conference. Why? Yeah. And then there was other people who were like, whoa, like he elevated me <coughs> above kind of the my my job my role what i'm thinking like to it you know in tech a strategic level where i'm like okay i'm i'm above all the you know the fog that's normally uh, uh, around me when i'm in on the ground floor of my or and now i'm just like thinking this is a journey this is a you know and so visually that's it got me there visually your story did too but i think yeah. visually is what kept me Hooked, and I think that's what brings people. So I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on on visual storytelling as part of your overall storytelling, or just the the importance of it. You know, pictures worth a thousand words, all of that sure. kind of stuff. What are your thoughts there? I'll I'll relate just briefly uh, to to just go right off it. It was the Glucon one that was probably the most far out talk I did. Um, I actually flipped the tables, and it was mostly story mostly visuals and a few slides that had tech on it. I like just completely reversed the whole thing. I think it was 30 slides and I think six of them had tech information on it. Uh, and I definitely got lots of lots of interesting feedback, one of which was I was not invited back to Glucon for many years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so I, 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 may, I may have crossed the line. One, one of the things that, that I learned in that particular experience, because I really wanted to have a visual, a visual story, that just has some narration on it. Um, I too am visually challenged. I really don't know what I'm, what I want. I don't think in that way. And working with my daughter, who's a skilled uh, artist, she's been published on magazine covers and, and anime art and stuff like this. Working with her, the questions she would ask really changed the way I even thought about talking. So the visuals that she ended up creating really changed some of the things that I, some of the ways I said things. There were things I didn't have to say at all. There were things that I could spend more time on. Um, so I had an amazing interaction with her. And I've done that with two other artists over the last 10 years or so. And every time I end up learning so much more about what I think I'm thinking mm -hmm. when I have to help somebody try to create a visual of what I think I'm looking for. And it's been a fantastic, it's been a fantastic journey. I hear in, in that story, like the aha when my head went up is like, oh yeah, this is something I've experienced too, but not necessarily with, uh, with visuals. It's whenever you have to explain anything to anyone else that is in your head. Um, if it's, you know, one of the, one of the nice things about um, the like open world beyond it being open is that like, you can do the first, second, third, fourth, fifth pass of a story against a different person and see what comes out the other end and what questions they ask. And the same thing too with jokes, like people laugh at different things in different places. And in user interviews, like I intentionally never pitched the thing the same way to every single person. Part of that is listening to what I hear from them and using that as part of the story. But the other part of it is like, I'd rather tell 10 and figure out which two were most resonant and then, you know, modify those two and make 10 more of each, like than then trying to um, like spend all my time in my journal writing the perfect, you know, one liner and then put it on the website and say, that's it forever. Like, um, so, so anytime you have to share something with someone with a different mental model, if it can be interactive, I think that you can get a lot out of it. And um, it, it's funny that I had a suspicion that when you were talking about this, presentation, Mike, you were going to say something to the effect of doing it taught me more than presenting it. Um, and I'm not surprised that that's the case. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I learned and, and it, learning is exactly uh, the way I was thinking you're talking about when I need to talk to the artist and I explain to the artist and the artist comes back with something that is not at all what I'm thinking. Suddenly I'm learning so much about the way I'm communicating. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of times I've had a few cases where an artist said, oh, you mean blah, blah, blah. And then a bulb goes off and says, no, but that's so much better. <laughs> you know, like I end up learning something totally new from another perspective. So that iteration that you're talking about and when you're talking to people, I'm sure this works when you're working on a set, right? When you're working on material, 
trying it out in different ways, learning from people is incredibly powerful. And, and I, I, I find that is another gift that I've received because I've started taking this sort of storytelling point of view that Ken, you talked about uh, so long ago. Yeah, if you start with, I'm gonna explain a complicated technical concept and why this should be what everyone else does uh, <laughs> versus I'm gonna tell people a story that will change the way they think at the next meeting they attend. Um, those are two very different ways to evaluate the finished product that you put together. And, and one of them is like way more human and conscious and uh, requires empathy and compassion than just being like, well, the proof is right. So the proof is right. Like it just, it's a completely different world. And um, I think there's like, you know, my, my whole like thing is like a lot of the jobs and a lot of the things to do are going to get automated in the next 30 years. And what's going to be left is this human factor. Like it's all of us. And yep. if you think about, you know, once we've made everything so efficient that there's no more efficiency to gain, um, it's they're going to be like, well, we got to raise the bar on everyone we work with. We got to raise the bar on ourselves. Yep. That's the area that we can keep pushing. And that also like raises everyone to um, hopefully being living more fulfilled lives where they're able to, as a one person, start a company that's really meaningful yep. or, or um, create a brand or create a, you know, a, a thing that means things to a lot of other people, whether it's a story or a group or anything else. Like we're getting this, this leverage. And I think, I think the way we get the most out of it is that we, we raise ourselves and stories and thinking about the world as stories and thinking about stories as things that we can change um, has, been, hit, has been and can be really, really liberating. And I think if you start there, you get to different places than if you start from like a technical point of view. Yeah, I like that. I'm I'm stuck, Mike. You'll appreciate this. And I'm stuck in repetitive loops. Um, fascinated with Norbert Weiner and his theories on feedback loops. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm into like my fifteenth book, different angle. Um, this one is was it Dream Machines? It's all about Licklighter and then the Sage yes. Network. But it had a, a perception of of Weiner that I, or Weiner that I never saw that. He was kind of an asshole, um, yeah. and he, but he, and how he kind of ran everybody off um, because he got concerned with the military because his started with feedback control systems on military in World War II, and then all the way to the mid '50s where he kind of just dropped out of it all by the time because all the money was going into the Sage Network, which is the, yeah. the aircraft control. It was the oh, first system. network, and so, but I'm really hung up on the feedback loop aspects of all of this. Is like you know, and then translating it to now and then the storytelling piece. And then one of the stories that you were just reminding me of, uh, Aiden, is I got a lot of pushback. I get a lot of pushback on people saying, hey, right now it's all about private APIs. The public API movement of the last decade was a mistake and enterprises aren't interested in doing it. And so I'm trying to work on feed, like without it, you don't get feedback. You don't, you know, and it comes back to my, why do you, why do I publish some of my personal stories on my blog is because without it, I don't get feedback. Mm -hmm. And it, am I wanting that feedback because ego and because I mm. feel important or am, is it feedback because it enriches my storytelling and, and propels me forward? I would say it's a mix. I'm not in denial about my ego, but you know, I do most, love... Most things in the world are ands, not ors. Like 99.9% yeah. yes. of everything can be an and if you find yes. an and. Yeah. Well, and, and, and that's, I mean, just to you know, bring it to much more prosaic levels, I mean, that's exactly what they teach you in improv, right? It's always yes and, right? There are whole books on this notion of framing never, it as... You never stop and. talking, yeah. <laughs> right. You always keep going and you never deny whatever was handed you, right? You always take it. And you turn it into whatever you want to turn. People it into. give me very terrible things just to see what I can do with it. And <laughs> exactly, that's I don't going want back to, take to it. that's why I don't do yeah. it not very much. <laughs> I remember when I was uh, I had a persona that wore a tie uh, to work every day, and I was in training to be you know this leader person, and I was taught um, that I needed to change the way I interacted with people, and, and the, the the helpful advice, the the one that landed for me, was the one that said, well, you could also think about it this way, which is basically like, don't deny everybody their point of view, think about it also, right? And that's that, that same sort of idea. And that to me is feedback looping. So what happens is when I, when I get into this habit of saying no to people, when I get in the habit of saying no to an idea or no to a concept, what I'm doing is I'm shutting off the feedback loop. 
I'm actually, you know, like you, you talked Aiden about bouncing off, like I'm, things are bouncing off now, they're not landing. Mm -hmm. But if I say yes and, or if I say also, right, rather than X or, right, all of a sudden, there are pieces that fly by me that I don't understand, but there are other things that I can pick up. And there are other things that make sense. And there are other things that land. So I think that's a big part of Aiden, what you're kind of describing to me is this, is this idea of, of making sure that I'm, I'm paying attention in some kind of way. So where, where would you guys like to see this go? I've got some, I mean, both this conversation right now, like how yeah. long are we going to sit here and talk? Because I think we're approaching an hour here and we yeah. want to be mindful of each other's times and whatnot and, yeah. and, and weeks. But um, I would like to see this continue. So before I throw out my ideas and, 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 uh, and lead that, uh, what, what would your guys' vision around this be? Do we want more storytelling? Want more voices in here? Do we want to repeat this or is this a one-time thing? What do you think? Go ahead, Aiden. I think you could do, like the, the conversation Mike and I had on Wednesday was we spent, I think we spent an hour and 10 minutes talking about personal storytelling in our narrative, uh, which is how this started for me and, and how I think about this. It's really been fun to hear your guys' view about how storytelling has affected your careers and how it also is a component of your careers, which is like, it's, it's been that way on, for both of you, which is, is cool too. Um, and that's a side I, I didn't know as much about coming in, and I feel like I have a better understanding of now, thanks to your stories. Um, but yeah, like my personal belief is pretty much 99.9% .9 of life is telling stories to each other and telling stories to ourselves. And the skill of knowing what stories to tell ourselves and what stories to tell others and how to tell them is um, something that is transferable to every industry, every field, every kind of person. And uh, something that I feel like there's there's a lot of um, mind share in this room that would agree with that premise and also be able to storytell around it in a way that other people can pick it up and make it useful in their lives. And that's like taking this leverage and, um, and figuring out how to help other people do the same thing, whether it's public or not, like, you know, writing down a paragraph every week about your life, like, I, like this started on Twitter, like, that is a useful thing to do. And it teaches you a lot about yourself. And if you write a paragraph about your team and your company or your company every week, like that is also going to make people more aware of how they're working and what's going on in their lives. So I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of things we can share and a lot of perspective that we can help other people obtain if we kept telling stories about storytelling. Yeah. I, I like, I like that idea of like storytelling can be empowering, right? It's kind of, and knowing, having the skill and having the ability is, is really empower empowering. I think another one, the way I think about this, is uh goes back to my point is like i need to hear more stories mm -hmm. from places i don't normally hear stories right um i need to be uh i need to be in a place where i have never heard this voice i have never heard this perspective that to me is like again that sort of stuff that kind of sinks in i think of uh, aiden we I, I don't know if we've talked about this do you guys know sean wilderman's book hello or his video hello world I haven't no. seen it. No. Sean, Sean is a developer. I've known Sean for a long time. Sean w wanted to sort of get right a create a, a story about like, how did you get into programming? Along the way, he discovered all these non white male developers that he had never noticed. Mm -hmm. And the stories they had, his video became a completely different topic. And that was why did I never meet these people who have been here the whole time? Why didn't I never even notice them when they were in the room? And why didn't I ever learn from them over all this time? So this ability, to, so he gave his 30 minute production, video production, which is on Vimeo somewhere. He really gave that over to the stories that he had never heard before, which I thought was just a brilliant, a brilliant operation. It's called Hello World, Sean Wilderman. It's a wonderful, wonderful video. Uh, but anyway, I would love to be hearing more stories. I would love to have more people in the room. And that doesn't necessarily mean that I need to be in the room when it's happening. Like just mm -hmm. hearing more stories of a, a platform where stories are told of, of whatever type is just to me, it's a super powerful. Well, so my, my selfish motivations and part of why I harangued you guys into this is I wanna, I'm trying to get certain things happening on my Fridays. Um, mm -hmm. This is now my full-time job to be working on API specifications and standards. Um, it's what I'm going to be doing, which 
um, are common vocabularies that I think we can use in machine readable storytelling or I don't know. I, I think there was a tweet that you, yeah. someone said the other day that was describing what difference between Alps, difference between open APIs. Do you know the one yeah. I'm talking about? Yes, yeah. Philip, Philip Kalarik. Yeah. Yeah. And really like, so, I mean like 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. on Fridays I do, it's all my municipal. So it's, it's, 211 and 311 standards for cities. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Open API, using open API definitions and having a standard for how we communicate around health and human services and non emergency events for municipalities. So that's my 7 to 8 a.m. Mm. wake up, that Buick in the driveway trying to get it warmed up, <laughs> um, which I love, but you know, it's sometimes like, Jesus. Good metaphor. Yeah. Um, yeah. 8 a.m. To nine is my uh, API specification toolbox. Open Office Hours. It started as Open API. We round, we widened it to um, JSON schema, async, and now all specs. So I want to do segments that are dedicated to Alps. I want to do Avro, Thrift. I want to do so. I'm I'm widening that. That's my toolbox. Um, nine is becoming open open ecosystem. So. Um, UN related, European Commission related, yeah. equity. Um, so it's Mark Boyd, platformable. Yeah. Him and I are talking, how do we make API ecosystems more equitable? Okay, it's great that we have the fire specification, but how's it helping people of color? You know, that could work. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so I'm going to carve out 11 till 12, and we'll see who can make it. We may need to move it earlier if we want international voices. Um, I'm learning that. But I'm going to just go ahead and carve out this as a storytelling hour because I think it all fits with the kind of common vocabularies, common patterns, storytelling. Um, you guys are welcome to be like the cornerstones of it if you guys have the time and bandwidth. I'm just going to put it in the calendar. If you two show up, awesome, but it's a, it's, it's a, it's a marker for me to just kind of move forward. I would also encourage you two to bring other stories to the table, like if you guys have stories that you think should be told or new like bring entirely new things and new people if we want to bring other people or if you want to send someone in your place maybe that would be cool mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. i just would challenge to to the three of us and then to the wider space anybody who's watching this or uh you know tunes in in any way that 11 to 12 pacific time um so it's later for you guys but um kind of a storytelling time on friday it helps it'll it'll help ground me um, I want to try to find some new voices, some new 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 storytelling, uh, you know, people to, to bring to the table, and hopefully we can bring some diverse folks to the table. Yeah, um, and see where it goes. You guys, let me know your thoughts. I I, I love this basic idea, and I, and I love the sort of the low barrier of entry of it too. It's like just mm -hmm. set aside this time, and let's see what happens. I I could definitely I'd, I'd be willing to commit some time for a while to see how this develops, and I'm already starting to you know trundle in my brain about. Who else I want to drag into this thing? So okay. I would love, I would love to get involved. I'd okay. love to. Yeah, I, just talking about storytelling helps me with all the storytelling I do, whether it's personal, public, somewhere in between. Um, and I also feel like the point you two both have made about getting access to to more stories and then making sure that those stories are told in a safe environment around interesting people, yeah. so we hear the full story. And that if it, people want to share that, it can be shared. And just yep. giving us all more access to more stories. And hopefully, people who also benefit from them getting access to it seems like a worthy investment of an hour to me. Okay. I'm just, I'm just going to make a side comment. Your schedule just intimidates the hell out of me, Kim. <laughs> I'm just telling you that. I don't know how uh, you do it. I like it. Uh, and I'm actually looking forward to ramping it up because cool. like, I've been spread so thin across other things that like, this yeah. is my full time gig now. So, yeah. Um, I love these conversations and I would say this is kind of a soft landing for the week. Like if I could go into the 12 o'clock hour on my Friday afternoon, <laughs> rebooting with stories and like erase everything that just happened, you know, or not erase, but yeah. you know, soften, yeah. soften me going into the weekend on the storytelling note, I'm going to be a much happier person. So. There you go. I'd be, I'd be happy to contribute to that as well. Yeah. All right, cool. Let's, uh, let's put on the calendar and we'll start bringing some interesting let's voices. Do it. Well, I will take this video, um, and with my limited iMovie skills, I will put something on the beginning and something at the end, yeah. and then um, something we can maybe improve in the future, bring someone who has some actual skills to do eventually. Um, 
what do we call this? Is this API storytelling or is it just, is it not API? Is it, you know, what is it? I'm fine. I'm fine with that. API tech story, okay. storytelling, I think somewhere in there. Yeah. Storytelling definitely isn't as good a keyword as API storytelling, but, uh, yeah. I think, uh, I think we will very quickly realize if we're trying to have conscious conversations that, um, behind every API and behind every company, behind every team and every project and everything else that we do and have as the, the, those are, those things are what bring us through the story. But the story is about all the things we don't see in the change log. Like it's all the stuff that happens in between. So, well, I think yeah. And the API for me, I'm, I'm out. I mean, one, it's again, I, it's what I'm best at. It's, it, yeah. but it op it's the pinhole into all these worlds. And I can find more people and stories to bring with the API connection because I'm thinking people like, you know, like Raven at Smithsonian. Yeah. Yeah. You I'd know? love to get Raven. Yeah. people like that that we can bring in like so apis open up these doorways like the, the work she's doing it on on archives yeah. and collections with with data you know and so yeah i can find a bunch of those and start start looping them in and so i'm going to keep it api api storytelling unless someone Sounds comes fine. up with something better because it yeah. um i mean it's it's the key to my doorway it's yeah it's, you know yeah uh, i was i was just commenting i wasn't commenting that we shouldn't do that i think it makes yeah. a lot of sense and yeah. uh, It'll bring in a good, a good set of initial people. I was just saying, I hope that, I hope that we all get to things that aren't. I hope the way we ask questions to each other gets us to things that are beyond the API. I agree. Real part of the story. Agreed. Yep. Agreed. Yep. yep. I like that a lot. Okay, well, man. Well, thank you too. Excellent. Yeah, thanks gentlemen. for having us, Ken. Thanks for doing it. And uh, in there. I'll ping you guys by email once I do something with this, and we can see where it goes. Great. Right, cool. Awesome talk. See you Have later. a good weekend. Good to see you. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.